In past years, the Mazda 3 has rarely figured amongst the family hatchback sector's stronger offerings, despite the fact that 3.6 million examples of this car are already pounding global roads. In third generation form though, it deserves far more careful consideration. Redesigned from the ground up, it's powerful, efficient and very good to drive. If you're shopping in this segment, you probably weren't considering buying one, but you probably should be. Defy convention. That's apparently what the third generation Mazda 3 is designed to do. It's not something that's immediately obvious at first glance, but stay with me. There's genuine innovation and cleverness here, if you care to look for it. I'll get to that in a minute, but a little background first. The 3 is the most important model this Japanese brand makes, a family hatchback pitched to sell in the class dominated by Ford's Focus, and also initially based upon that car in its earliest guises. First and second generation Mazda 3 models introduced in 2003 and 2009 both had Focus underpinnings. This Mark III model though, announced late in 2013, is very much its own vehicle and must be a big step forward if it's to reverse a sales decline that's seen its maker's European sales fall by almost 50% in recent years. It can't, in other words, be conventional. It isn't. True, the styling and the sizing are much as you would expect, but the engine range isn't. Where other brands are downsizing and turbocharging their power plants to make them more efficient, Mazda has kept engine capacity but found other ways to enhance efficiency and improve balance sheet returns, mainly through reductions in weight. Which is why this car's mainstream petrol unit is 2 litres in size at a time when most other rivals are producing comparable outputs from 1.4, 1.2 or even 1 litre power plants. The mainstream 2.2 litre diesel's big in size too, but also small in running costs. It all enables this car to stack up as well on paper as it now does in the showroom, thanks to a much classier cabin. Add that to the accomplished driving dynamics that have long been a Mazda 3 strong point, and potentially you've a quietly affected package for Focus families prepared to look beyond the obvious contenders in this marketplace. We're going to put it to the test. The Mazda 3 has always been good to drive. But then, in its first two generations of life, there were lots of reasons for that, like underpinnings from the acclaimed Ford Focus and old-style responsive hydraulic steering. This third generation model is very different, so can it stack up now that it's very much its own car? In a word, yes. Now, there are so many reasons for this that it's hard to know which one to start with. Other brands insist that decent performance must be accompanied by untenable running costs. Mazda doesn't. Other brands limit sophisticated multi-link rear suspension to their very priciest models. Mazda doesn't. Which is why where other brands will tell you that rewarding handling and a comfortable day-to-day -day ride can't be provided in the same package, Mazda again begs to differ. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that this 3 is in any way perfect. It's a little noisier than the class norm, and you occasionally get a bit of a fidgety ride over poorer surfaces. Other rivals may also have slightly classier cabins too. These things apart though, there really isn't much to grouse about here. There's a different approach, and it's one that you notice in the first 50 metres. Many cars of this kind feel remote and inert when you first set off in them. Switching your responses to autopilot and reducing your expectations of journeying enjoyment to the bare minimum. But here, it's different. Let me start by talking about the first thing that I noticed upon initial acquaintance with this car. The slick gear shift quality. Now its predecessor offered an annoyingly sticky shift action which spoiled an otherwise beautifully developed driving environment that saw almost ideal placement of seat, pedals and switch gear. Now that you can swap through the six ratios properly with wrist flip changes, there remains nothing to get in the way of what the Japanese call toitsukan, 
uh, a word that describes the feeling that you get of greater control. Control that's more predictable, uh, more assured, more usable. Keen drivers will know what I'm talking about when I say that some family hatchbacks seem to want to fight your inputs and are a bit of a battle to drive, whereas others just work in harmony with you. This Master 3 is one of the latter. Its sophisticated suspension just works on British roads, and should you feel the urge, you can cover ground at real pace without the car feeling ragged or tiring to drive. The front end is incredibly good, and you'd have to be doing something extremely ill-advised to bring the stability or traction uh, control into play on dry tarmac. Refinement has been improved as well, and uh, electric power steering has been introduced with no real dilution of the feelsome response that was such a feature of the old hydraulic setup. So how has Mazda done it? The answer, they'll tell you, lies in a style of thinking that underpins almost everything about this car, and it isn't something incomprehensibly Japanese or, thank goodness, a piece of zoom zoom marketing fluff. Instead, Sky Active is an all-encompassing term for efficient technology that drives down running costs by saving weight, and that ramps up driving enjoyment by doing exactly the same thing. It's a solution that seems so obvious, and one that every other rival brand strives to achieve before getting bogged down in having to make its products bigger, better equipped, safer and better built. But then no other brand has invested itself into the process quite like Mazda. Integral to the Mazda 3 lineup are Skyactiv powertrains, Skyactiv bodies, and Skyactiv six speed manual and automatic gearboxes. All of them with bulk trim to the minimum, with the collective result that this car is significantly lighter than most of its rivals. As a result, it will accelerate more quickly, stop more sharply, corner more keenly, the suspension will be able to do its job more effectively, and you won't be exacting such a huge demand on brakes, transmission and tyres. Hardly a marginal improvement then, but instead one that you can really feel, especially through the bends, where uh, thanks not only to light weight, but also to responsive steering and an uncommonly stiff chassis, up 30% uh, in terms of rigidity over its predecessor, this Mazda is exceptionally nimble and agile for a model of its size. Onto those Skyactiv G petrol and Skyactiv D diesel engines then. I've got the diesel here, a pokey 150 PS 2.2 litre unit with a lusty 380 newton metres of torque that's enough to facilitate a 1500 kilogram brake towing limit. More importantly, we have a car here that, to all intents and purposes, is able to offer the performance of a 2 litre diesel with the economy you'd usually expect from a diesel 1.6. What kind of performance? Well, rest to 62 miles an hour occupies just 8.1 seconds on the way to 130 miles an hour. You can also order this power plant with a six speed automatic gearbox, but that has quite an impact on running costs. The same applies if you choose the automatic option with the engine the vast majority of Mazda 3 customers will select, the 120 PS 2 litre petrol unit. Now, if you are limited on price, someone who covers low mileages, or simply prefer to fuel from the green pump, then with a manual gearbox fitted, this is the variant to choose. Here, 62 miles an hour takes 8.9 seconds en route to 121 miles an hour, a vast improvement on the figures returned by an entry level 100 PS 1.5 litre variant that's no cheaper to run and not much less expensive to buy. There is also a minority interest 165 PS version of the 2 litre petrol engine at the top of the range, but its figures, 0 to 62 miles an hour in 8.2 seconds and 130 miles an hour flat out, aren't much of an improvement. Less is more. Come to think of it, that sums up the Mazda 3 driving experience rather neatly. If you're searching for some kind of visual DNA that links the three generations of Mazda 3 produced to date, then you'll search in vain. In each case, the Hiroshima brand has started with a clean sheet of paper, an approach which hasn't helped in building a firm identity amongst buyers. But then, maybe the designers have merely been casting around for the right look 
upon which to build. And this could well be it. It's certainly the most cohesively styled version of this car we've seen to date, with a bold cab rearwards profile, a rakish windscreen, a lower roofline, shorter overhangs, flared wheel arches, and an extended wheelbase that pushes the wheels out into the corners of the car. Up front, there's the same so-called Kodo design approach that also characterizes both the larger Mazda 6 and the company's CX-5 crossover model. True, Kodo isn't a very inspiring acronym, but what it apparently stands for when you translate from the Japanese, soul of motion, offers up a more emotive feel. This is supposed to be a theme inspired by the movement of animals in the wild. No, I can't see that either in the look of this car, but at least the Kodo key point, a boldly contoured five point grille with a distinctive signature line that runs through its lower lip into piercing headlamps, at last gives this car some much needed visual identity move beyond the long bonnet and start to look further back, and fans of the brand might notice the repositioned wing mirrors, now sighted on the shoulders of the lightweight doors, while the rest of us are more likely to be impressed by the incredibly tight shut lines, and a sleek profile that results in a slippery 0.26 CD figure for this hatchback variant. This body style only comes with five doors, but if you do want an alternative, Mazda are rather bravely offering a so-called fastback saloon variant, Volkswagen's Jetta being the only other notchback contender in this area of the market. The fastback option will inevitably be a minority choice in the UK, but it can offer an impressive 419 litres of luggage space. Mind you, this hatchback doesn't do too badly on that score. Uh, lift the tailgate and there's 364 litres of space on offer, 18 litres more than the previous generation of this model could offer, and about 15% more room than you get in a rival Ford Focus. If that's not enough, then flattening the 60-40 split folding rear bench increases uh, capacity to 1,263 litres across a completely flat cargo bed. You can't help feeling that these figures could have been even better, but for the designer's decision to lower the roofline in search of this generation version's sportier looks. The floor to roof cargo capacity dimension for this car is, after all, about 50 millimetres less than the class average. Still, that would be more noticeable if the same impact was felt on rear seat headroom. Fortunately, this remains well up to segment standards. Legroom, in fact, is actually better than you'd normally expect from this class of car, thanks to the 60mm wheelbase increase, though the scooped out seat backs do force rear passengers to keep their knees in one place. As for cabin width, well, this car is 40mm wider than its predecessor, but that hasn't affected the usual observation in this sector, that while two adults will be quite comfortable. Three will find it a bit of a squash. But it's the at the wheel experience that I was most intrigued to try with this third generation three. In recent years, Mazda has mastered the art of interesting exterior design and produced a whole series of models that charm at first glance before disappointing when you actually take a seat inside. This one's a big improvement in this respect. For a start, it feels of much better quality than before, with enough use of satin chrome metal and soft touch plastics to ensure that the gorgeous optional leather finish fitted to this particular variant doesn't feel as ridiculously out of place as it might on some more poorly finished rivals. Yes, a few more cheaply finished plastics do still remain if you choose to look for them, but overall it's a cabin that downsizes from far more expensive vehicles will feel much more comfortable with. As for practicality, well, it's a pity the door pockets aren't bigger, but the glove box is decently sized. Plus, you've got the usual cup holders, as well as a tray in front of the gear stick on which to store things. As ever with the Mazda 3, it's all supposed to feel a bit sporty, and though here there's not the properly low-slung driving position that would really emphasise that, you do get all the things that make you feel more at one with the car you're driving, with ideal positioning for the pedals, the steering wheel and the gear knob, 
plus excellent all-round vision achieved, in this case, by the repositioning of the A-pillars and the wing mirrors. There's a tendency to think every brand has already got this right, but it's only when you get yourself into a model that actually has that you appreciate the small but subtle differences that perfection in this respect can bring. The revised instrument layout works well too, with one central dial that's either a speedometer, if you've got a standard spec model, or a rev counter, if, as here, you've opted for a head-up display that projects the key uh, information, speed and so on, onto a pane of glass that rises at the bottom of the windscreen. With the rev counter, you also get an incorporated digital speed display. The best bit, though, is this latest generation 7-inch colour TFT touchscreen, a vast improvement on the cramped little infotainment display fitted not only to the previous generation of this model, but also to the current and supposedly more luxurious Mazda 6. Controlled by touch, uh, voice command, or by this smart chromed rotary dial positioned down here by the, thankfully, conventional gear stick, it's a delight to use. Uh, alleviating dashboard clutter by handling various uh, audio and telephonic functions. Plus, it can also help you with the eco-friendliness of your driving and display sat-nav where it's fitted. Now, fortunately, the system doesn't try and replace uh, conventional ventilation controls, but the setup does include the clever cloud-based connectivity platform that Mazda has developed to bring a wide range of free web-based infotainment content safely into the vehicle. Uh, two apps in particular, AHA for various infotainment features, including text, Twitter and Facebook, and Stitcher for on-demand internet radio the 21st century family hatch has truly arrived. Mazda 3 pricing sits mainly in the 17 to 23,000 pound bracket across a range of five door hatchbacks and four door fastback saloons. Both body styles are identically priced. There's a choice of 1.5 or 2 litre Skyactiv G petrol engines, but I can't really see the point of choosing the 1.5 apart from the fact that it's the only mainstream unit in the range not to be offered with an automatic gearbox option, it's much slower, no cheaper to run, and is only £300 less than its pokier counterpart. There's a premium of nearly £2,500 to graduate from the 2-litre petrol to the top 2.2-litre Skyactiv D diesel variant that I've been trying here. So, overall, how does the Mazda 3's value proposition stack up against its rivals? I'm going to assume that you're looking at this hatchback version because the fastback saloon variant only really has one particularly direct four-door competitor, Volkswagen's Jetta, comparable versions of which cost either a thousand or two thousand pounds or so more depending on whether you're looking at a Mazda 3 in two litre petrol or 2.2 litre diesel form. But the really tough opposition for this Japanese brand will come with rivals to the hatchback body shape that most buyers will want. Other models in this segment may look cheaper, but that's because they come with the much feebler petrol and diesel engines that Mazda doesn't bother with. Now, provided you compare like with like, you should find that this car does pretty well stacked up against the best technology that other segment contenders can offer. Let's start with the Skyactiv G petrol options. Now, as I've suggested, this car's proposition isn't at its strongest in base 1.5 litre form, but you could still make some sort of a case for it. It's undercut by rival 1.4 litre versions of Vauxhall's Astra, Kia Seed, Hyundai's i30 and Toyota's Auris, but it costs no more than a 1.4 litre Honda Civic or a 1.6 litre Renault Megane. And all of these competitors offer much older, thirstier engines. Tougher, more sophisticated competition comes from the high-performing 1.2-litre turbo petrol units you'll find in a Peugeot 308 and Seat Leon. Slightly cheaper cars that can match a base petrol Mazda 3's performance, though not its equipment levels. Also lacking kit compared to the most affordable version of this Mazda is the kind of equivalent Ford Focus 1.0-litre EcoBoost 100 PS that costs around the same and the sort of comparable Volkswagen Golf 1.2 TSI that's nearly £2,000 more. 
But let's move swiftly on to the kind of Mazda 3 you'd actually seriously want to consider, the 2.0-litre petrol version, or more specifically, the 120 PS 2.0-litre petrol version. For hatchback buyers, there's also a 165 PS version of this unit, but it's only offered at a premium of just over £700 over the cost of the priciest trim level. Gives you only a marginal performance advantage and will set you back significantly more to run. I wouldn't bother. So, let's focus on the 120 PS 2.0-litre petrol model, which looks tempting at prices starting from around £17,000. Now, this undercuts comparably engine versions of all the other major contenders in this segment, assuming you ignore Vauxhall's Astra 1.6 VVT, which is around £1,000 cheaper because its engine is old and slow. Even an equivalently powerful 1.6-litre petrol Kia Seed or high-end i30 will cost you slightly more. In comparison to a 2-litre petrol Mazda 3, you'll need £1,000 more to get yourself an equivalent Ford Focus 1-litre EcoBoost 125 PS, a Seat Leon 1.4 TSI, or a Peugeot 308 1.2 eThp 130, and around £2,000 more for a Renault Megane 1.2 TCE or a Volkswagen Golf 1.2 TSI. It's a similar story if you're looking at the Mazda 3 variant I've been testing here, the 150 PS 2.2 litre Skyactiv D diesel, a class leader when it comes to running costs. It's priced to give you decent change from £20,000, the same kind of money you'd pay for far feebler 1.6 litre Volkswagen Golf and Honda Civic diesels. High output diesel 1.6 litre Renault Megane and 2 litre Peugeot 308 models can't match this 2.2 litre Mazda's performance, even though they cost significantly more. Still, at least those two are almost as frugal to run as this Mazda. You couldn't say that about the comparable but costlier 2 litre Ford Focus and Vauxhall Astra diesels that are much thirstier and dirtier and still not quite as quick. Better is the Volkswagen Group's 150 PS 2 litre TDI unit, but in comparison to this Mazda, that's nearly a thousand pounds more when fitted to a Seat Leon and around two and a half thousand pounds more when fitted to a Golf. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a Mazda 3 that you really want, then whichever engine you choose in your five door hatchback or four-door fastback Mazda 3, 1.5 or 2-litre Skyactiv G petrol or 2.2-litre Skyactiv D diesel, then you're going to need to know what you can expect in terms of standard equipment. A reasonable amount, as it happens. So, all variants come with daytime running lights, alloy wheels of at least 16 inches in size, uh, power folding heated mirrors, air conditioning, keyless start, a height adjustable driver's seat, a trip computer, an auto dimming rear view mirror, integrated Bluetooth phone compatibility, a Thatcham Category 1 alarm, and hill hold assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Most importantly, perhaps, you also get the Mazda Multimedia System with its 7-inch colour TFT touchscreen, onto which you can integrate a whole range of apps like Aha and Stitcher, as well as internet radio and social media functions like Facebook and Twitter. More conventionally, you can access a six-speaker stereo system with aux in, iPod and USB inputs with controls on the leather-wrapped steering wheel. Further up the range, there are nav options for all the main trim levels that give you a very effective satellite navigation system. And on plusher models, you'll get the chance to specify niceties like a premium Bose surround sound audio system with nine speakers and a head-up display that projects key driving information onto a little glass pane at the bottom of the windscreen so that there's less need to take your eyes off the road. Top models like this one also offer leather trim that I'd want to pay extra to get with the light stone colour finish that I have here, which breaks up what is otherwise a rather dark cabin. And talking of paying extra for things, if you do have extra in your budget, this specially developed soul red metallic paint finish with its embedded tiny flakes of reflective pigment looks simply gorgeous. And there's five star Euro NCAT rated standards of safety. 
In addition to Isofix child seat fastenings, tyre pressure monitoring, and a pedestrian friendly design for the front bonnet and bumper, there are of course the expected twin front, side and curtain airbags. If these should ever be needed, there's a Skyactiv body engineered Triple H body structure to protect you from impact forces and SCR secondary collision reduction, which automatically applies the brakes and has a warning flashes after an impact to reduce the likelihood of a secondary accident. Now, to hopefully avoid such a thing in the first place, there's the usual electronic assistance for TCS traction control and DSC stability control. Anti-lock brakes too, with a brake assist system for emergency stops advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard flashing lights. All models also get the SCBS Smart City Brake Support System, one of those clever setups with a radar mounted in the top of the windscreen that constantly scans the road ahead for collision hazards as you drive. If one is detected, the system will warn the driver and prime the brakes. If he or she doesn't respond or isn't able to, then the brakes will be automatically applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. And beyond that, well, personally, I'd be tempted to find around £700 more to get myself the very comprehensive safety pack, which adds rear vehicle monitoring to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake when there's a car in your blind spot, uh, lane departure warning that stops dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes on the highway, and high beam control that automatically dips your headlights in the face of oncoming traffic at night. And talking of headlights, uh, plusher models like this one get an AFS, that's Adaptive Front Lighting System, that alters the headlamp beam to better illuminate your way around the curves. In a market full of brands who apparently believe that the future lies in various forms of electric power, Mazda is an exception. Yes, they've developed a two litre petrol hybrid version of this car, but for the European market, the company's emphasis is firmly on conventional petrol and diesel power plants and getting more from them. The company bases its approach around what it calls Sky Active technology, aimed not only at improving the efficiency of engines and transmissions, but crucially, also focusing on lightweight design, which has seen the engineers pour over this model in intricate detail, removing unnecessary bulk wherever they could find it. As a result, the engine, the gearbox and the chassis are all significantly lighter than before, leading to curb weight starting from just 1,347 kilograms, making this one of the lightest contenders in its class. How has Mazda been able to do that when so many other brands have failed to achieve meaningful weight reductions from their mainstream models? A key answer comes with the company's claim of class-leadingly low compression ratios for both Skyactiv-D diesel and Skyactiv-G petrol engines, the latter unit indeed rivaling a Formula One car in this respect. Now, if that means nothing to you, then I'll explain. A lower compression ratio means the engine has less in the way of mechanical stress. That means that lighter weight materials can be used to build it, and so the car needs less energy to move it through the air and no energy at all, in fact, when it comes to a temporary stop, say at the lights or in traffic. For at that point, an I-stop engine stop-start system, the fastest reacting setup of its kind on the market, will cut in, reducing fuel consumption by up to 10%, all on its own. The volume 2-litre petrol variant also gets the IE loop, that's short for Intelligent Energy Loop, brake regeneration system that's able to harvest and then reuse far more energy than comparable setups. Added to that, there are slippery aerodynamics and an opportunity for the driver to also do his or her bit by keeping an eye on the neat fuel economy monitor section of the infotainment screen that helps you monitor the efficiency of your driving. Add all those factors together and you get yourself a set of running cost returns that would have been simply unthinkable in a car of this class as recently as five years ago. So let's cut to the chase. What does it all mean when it comes to the bottom line? Essentially this, that you can equal or better the efficiency of a feebler rival with a more powerful Mazda 3. 
let's take the Skyactiv D 2.2 litre diesel variant I'm driving here. A car with a performance engine quick enough to power it to 62 miles an hour in just 8.1 seconds. You might wonder why Mazda doesn't offer a lower powered diesel than this, as virtually every other contender in the sector does. Well, it's because it doesn't need to. Weedy 90 PS diesel Volkswagen Golf and Ford Focus models manage about 70 miles to the gallon and CO2 returns around the 100 grams per kilometre mark. So does this 150 PS Mazda 3. To be specific, it returns 72.4 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 104 grams per kilometre of CO2, provided that you order it with the manual transmission I've got here. Opting for the automatic gearbox extracts quite a penalty, the returns falling significantly to 58.8 miles to the gallon and 127 grams per kilometre. The Skyactiv G petrol variants are also impressively efficient. Whether you go for the 100 PS 1.5 or the 120 PS 2 litre model, you can expect 55.4 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 119 grams per kilometre of CO2. So again, Mazda's technology is enabling a big engine, in this case a, a 2 litre, to return the kind of efficiency you expect from something a lot smaller. Examples in this case being 1.4 litre TSI versions of the Volkswagen Golf and the Seat Leon. Now, two other brands claim to offer similar levels of power with better efficiency. Ford with the 1 litre EcoBoost 125 PS engine fitted to their Focus, and Peugeot with their 1.2 litre ETHP 130 PS unit fitted to their 308. But in both cases, the performance you get is significantly inferior to that of a 2 litre Skyactiv G Mazda 3. As a petrol buyer, I think twice about tampering with this winning formula, either by ordering my 2 litre Mazda 3 with an automatic gearbox, in which case the combined fuel figure falls to 50.4 miles to the gallon and the CO2 return to 129 grams per kilometre, or by upping the power output and going for the 165 PS version of this engine, only available in manual gearbox guys. This top variant manages 48.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 135 grams per kilometre and still isn't quite as fast as the preferable diesel variant that I'm driving here. What else? Well, it's useful that the infotainment system can give you maintenance reminders and insurance. Well, uh, the groupings figures are a little unfairly high, I thought, uh, especially given the standard fitment of the smart city brake support system across the range and the impact that will make on avoiding low speed collisions. The mainstream 1.5 and 2 litre Skyactiv G petrol variants are rated at 13E and 18E. Uh, the top 165 PS 2 litre petrol is 22E and this diesel is 24E. That leaves only depreciation. Independent experts CAT reckon that uh, after the industry standard three year 60,000 mile ownership period, this car will still be worth around 35% of what you originally paid for it, uh, a result that comfortably outperforms most key competitors. Released from the shackles of Ford ownership, Mazda's product range is at last coming alive. The cars look and feel more appealing and innovation is now an established part of the company's DNA. Here's a perfect example of that. True, there are still many more obvious choices than this one within the family hatchback sector, but if you're bored with the usual Golf, Astra and Focus fare and want a car that won't impose a swinging financial penalty for wanting to be just that little bit different, the Mazda 3 is a smart pick. It's a model that's never achieved the success it really ought to have had, but deserves to now. True, it may not be one of those family hatchbacks that grab you on first acquaintance, but the longer you spend with one, the more you appreciate the depth of thought that's clearly been put into the design of things that matter, like the clever cabin, the exceptional infotainment system, and the high-tech equipment. Most of all though, this is a car built around its smart Skyactiv engine technology, offering a design approach rejecting small capacity turbo units that promise impressive running cost figures but rarely actually deliver them. In the real world, 
Mazda reckon their strategy of lightweight cleverness is the one that'll bring better day-to-day -day returns for customers, and they could well be right. Combine all of that with a rewarding driving experience and you've a car that ought to be hard for any right-thinking family hatchback buyer to ignore. One in every three Mazda sold anywhere in the world is a three. Don't expect that to change anytime soon.